Let's do a bar of hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we just come before your throne grateful for the gifts you've given us, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, too, for the Holy Spirit. We do pray, Father, that you just open our hearts and lives to your word and your word to our hearts and lives, that this would be profitable time for your kingdom. We just do pray, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight as we commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are in hour 19 of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, in which we're going to attempt to summarize or review what are called the church epistles, or, or another way to put it are the Pauline epistles. We took one of them in detail last time, the book of Romans, but we have uh, a dozen left to do. And, uh, but before we jump in, uh, we'll get a glimpse, obviously, of the early church through these things. And I think it's important for us to realize that these are re- these were real people, um, just like you and me. Uh, real problems, just like now. And uh, they were resolved by real people, uh, struggling to be effective pastors, leaders, deacons, whatever. Different styles, different personalities, but just regular guys and gals. Uh, real people struggling against the powers of darkness. This indeed is an adventure. Now, as we look at the New Testament, we obviously went through the, what I call the five Gospels. Luke volume 1 and volume 2 makes it five, the book of Acts being Luke's second volume. We're now in the 13 epistles of Paul. And I say 13 in the sense that I'm dismissing Hebrews as a separate topic for later. We went through Romans in detail, but now we're going to through, go through First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. The Thessalonian letters we'll touch on, but we'll review those next time for some special reasons. First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. That's our agenda for the evening. Now, it's interesting that Romans, the first of the Pauline epistles there, and the Hebrews, the first that are listed in the so-called Hebrew Christian epistles, are the major doctrinal epistles. So we'll, we'll just as we focused on Romans, and when we get to the next session, we'll, talk, we'll focus on Hebrews somewhat. But there are seven churches that Paul wrote. Now those of you that have studied Matthew 13 and you're sensitive to the fact that there were seven kingdom parables, and you're also, by looking ahead, know in Revelation, Jesus himself is going to address seven churches in a very mystical way, which we'll review uh, time after next. Um, Paul also wrote letters to seven different churches. That doesn't leap out at you because two of those went to, uh, at least two went to Corinthians and two went to Thessalonians, but there are actual seven churches that have been uh, gathered by the Holy Spirit into our New Testament. And that's going to be significant to us, I think, when we get to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. But those are the letters to churches. We then have four letters, two to Timothy and then two others, that are pastors. These letters are written, they're personal letters written to pastors that were embraced by the early church to be part of their their, uh, literary uh, treasures. And uh, there are also three, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, that were written during his first imprisonment at Rome. They're not the only ones written in prison because 2 Timothy was also written in his last imprisonment. But the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians are typically called the prison epistles because they were uh, uh, the the result of that, or or a a product, if you will, of his first imprisonment. And so, but um, our ultimate syllabus for this course in the epistles is summarized in 1 Timothy 3.16. Easy to remember because you all know John 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16 is a very key verse. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's quite a statement. That's a broad statement. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for three things. For doctrine for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And uh, by reproof, we really mean wrong conduct, and correction (coughs) implies wrong doctrine. Both are corrective measures 
but one is in personal conduct and one is doctrinal. Slight subtle difference there. I might call your attention to it. But you'll, if you look at the, the order of these epistles, Romans was a major doctrinal epistle. The doctrine that Romans really focuses on is that field of theology that, the, that would be called soteriology, which is just a fancy word for the study of salvation. Soteriology is that segment of theology that focuses on salvation. And the book of Romans is the pivotal doctrinal do piece there. But then it is followed by reproof and correction of that doctrine. First and Second Corinthians and the book of Galatians. Then we get to the, the uh, epistle of Ephesians. It also, while it's many things, is also doctrinal in the field of ecclesiology, the study of the church. It's interesting that many of the controversies in Bible prophecy are not really uh, controversies in the field of eschatology. That's the fancy word for study of the last things. Many people who argue about the, does the church go through the tribulation or not are confused, not about eschatology alone, but they haven't done their homework on what is the church really? How does the church distinct, how is it distinguished from other believers? There are many believers in the history of God's plan of redemption of people that are saved that are not in the church. People were saved before the church was born. People will be saved after the church is gathered. We need to understand that. So, but this church is very distinctive. The study of the church is ecclesiology. One of its pivotal, foundational doctrinal books uh, is, of course, the Epistle to the Ephesians. And then the Philippians and Colossians being reproof and correction of those doctrines, interestingly enough. And then, of course, we get to Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians. And there again, these are probably the most important doctrinal epistles when you study eschatology, the study of the last things. So soteriology, ecclesiology, and eschatology are simply fancy words for three of the many major segments of theology, as, as might be studied in a seminary or uh, in reading and that kind. So that's a quick perspective of where we're headed. Let's talk a little bit about Corinth. Um, Corinth, the Corinthian letters are a little confusing because you have two in your Bible, but we know there were at least four. Also, involving Corinth was at least three visits by Paul. And uh, so the, uh, the occasion of 1 Corinthians, uh, the household of Chloe came to Paul when he was in Ephesus, and uh, uh, the church had written him a letter, uh, and it apparently was brought to Ephesus by Stephanus and a group of others, uh, and uh, who probably also added their own comments. And apparently the situation was very, very serious, and Paul responded to this group by sending a letter to Corinth that we know as 1 Corinthians. So they came and visited him across the sea. He was in Ephesus. Corinth is on the other side of the Aegean. Um, and uh, he was very, very concerned. So that was, so he, he, his first visit, of course, was earlier is when the church was first founded. And he apparently had written them a previous letter. There's an allusion to a previous letter. We don't have that letter. But the household of Chloe visit Paul in Ephesus with a letter from Corinth exp expressing all these problems. And Paul's letter that we know as 1 Corinthians was his response to these problems, which are very serious. So 1 Corinthians is full of advice and counsel and concern. And, uh, and, and so then... There was a visit that Paul uh, undertook uh, because it got worse. So he left Ephesus and he p paid a hurried visit to uh, uh, Corinth to try to, you know, straighten things out. This would be his, uh, his uh, um, second visit. And uh, uh, he, has, uh, he makes references again uh, in, in subsequent letters to the sorrow there. Um, he writes after that painful visit, he writes to them a, what he calls a severe letter. This letter seems to have been lost, but he was very apprehensive about how it would be, was received. And um, so um, uh, this, this severe letter was very, very harsh, obviously, in its tone. And uh, if it had not been successful, it could have been very, very destructive. And so as he, 
he was very concerned as to how it would be taken. Now, some scholars believe that portions of that letter show up in, in what we call um, uh, Second Corinthians, because he, he, um, uh, he, he sends Titus, he agrees to meet Titus in Macedonia to see how it went. When he gets to Macedonia, he misses Titus at first. There's a big, he's very concerned because he wants to know how it went and so forth. But he finally does connect with Titus and fortunately finds out that his report was received very well. And in response to that, he writes his um, uh, fourth letter, really, what we call 2 Corinthians. Some scholars suspect that 2 Corinthians may include fragments that were part of what was the severe letter. There's, you know, scholars debate over some of these details. But the main point is that as you read Paul's letters, you need to realize that it, there were three different visits. Because obviously after that, 2 Corinthians is a very encouraging, upbeat, joyous letter. So it's, it's the favorite of many re- people. But um, the thir- the, uh, the, uh, it may have, may have included uh, some of the uh, segments of it, some scholars suspect maybe uh, have uh, appended from the uh, lost severe letter. But anyway, the point is, Paul uh, obviously will visit them subsequently, the third visit. So there are three visits, four letters. From those four letters, we have in our Bibles two of those. What we call 1 Corinthians, you could, if you want to confuse your neighborhood Bible study, refer to 2 Corinthians and call 2 Corinthians 4 Corinthians just to keep everybody confused. But uh, anyway, so for what that's worth. But let's take a look at this first epistle that Paul writes because of the problems there. One of the things he emphasizes in this is that schisms or divisions in the church are wrong. And uh, he talks there about true wisdom versus the foolishness of God. And I love that phrase, foolishness of God. You know, that's, that sounds like an oxymoron. How can you talk about the foolishness of God? Uh, but it's, it is interesting to realize how God seems to go out of his way to do things in strange ways. You know, he decides to wipe out the whole world and to save eight people on a, on a barge. And you, you, can go right, you can go right through the Old Testament. The remedies God uses to accomplish his purposes seem to uh, indicate the, uh, a very, very uh, uh, great willingness to engage in very strange remedies. The other, thing, other Paul, point that Paul makes in his Epistle of Corinthians is that human teachers are but stewards of God's truth. And um, he then goes through a whole series, uh, uh, after the first half a dozen chapters, he then replies to the other problems. He talks about marriage, meats, the Lord's table, all kinds of problems that were being abused in the Corinthian church. But also in this letter is a trilogy of chapters that are incredibly precious. Chapters 12, 13, and 14. Because he there, this is probably the definitive um, segment of scripture on the spiritual gifts. And he talks about them. We'll talk a little more about that. Then also in this letter is what some people could argue is the most important chapter of the New Testament. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. And the reason they would say that is because Paul himself argues that if we don't have what's in that chapter, everything else is foolishness. And that is the resurrection. The resurrection chapter is arguably the most important chapter in the Bible in, in, in some respects, and that is chapter 15 of, of, of uh, 1 Corinthians. But one of the things that, uh, just to give you some sampling here, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And he goes on to make a point. And I think it was uh, Queen Elizabeth that said, uh, she was saved by an M. What does she mean by that? Because she said in 1 Corinthians 1, it says, For you see your calling, brother, that how that not, it doesn't say not uh, any wise men of the flesh, not any mighty, not many. And she feels that she crawled in under that M, being obviously some of noble birth and yet saved. So uh, that's, that was her little uh, approach. But then it goes on, he says, For God hath chosen the foolish things of the world, to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And uh, so the foolishness of God, strange phrase. Noah's Ark, what a strange way to try to save a segment of the world. The whole idea of putting blood on the doorposts in Egypt in the Passover. Those are fundamentally strange ideas. God is making some points here. And this whole idea of raising a brass serpent, 
to save these people from snake bite? Makes no sense in the Old Testament. You can read the Old Testament all the way up to Malachi. It makes no sense until you get to John 3 where Jesus explains why God did that. As an idiom in advance of Jesus Christ. As, as, as Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be raised up. And you, then you start to unravel it and you find there's a whole profound lesson behind all that. The trumpets around Jericho. Can you imagine Joshua briefing his staff on his battle plan for Jericho? We're going to march around the city once a day for seven days, keeping silent. Then on the seventh day, we're going to march around seven times. Then we're going to blow our horns and shout, and the walls are all going to fall down. Really? I would love to see a, a dramatization of him selling that to his staff, you know. But, uh, and then, of course, the creator of the universe becoming a man and making his entrance riding a donkey? You know, these are, these are, if, these are and you go, and the whole idea of having a group of unlettered fishermen overturn the entire Roman Empire. Astonishing. Astonishing. Foolishness of God. And what's the ultimate foolishness of God? Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. A couple of ideas here. The preaching of the cross does sound like it's the final capstone of these apparently ostensibly foolish uh, remedies. But there's something else that occurs in this verse. Do you notice that the entire world is divided into two parts? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. People are either saved or not saved. And that's the astonishing uh, dichotomy of all of mankind. So Paul then hammers on stewardship. And we need to talk about salvation versus rewards. Fortunately, 1 Corinthians 3 deals with this. There's a great deal, there's so much emphasis on the fact that salvation is by grace, not by works. That's obviously the whole book of Romans, the whole book of Galatians is going to hammer that. Because of that emphasis, we have a tendency to ignore the other side of that coin. The idea of rewards for faithful service. You, Jesus may have saved you. The question, if, if I often ask an audience, how many of you are saved? The various hands will go up. And I'll say, great, what have you done with it? What fruit has it borne? Is there a changed life? Has there been fruit for the kingdom? So there's this whole issue of rewards that Paul deals with. See, there are two foundations that he highlights. Gold, silver, precious stones being one of them. And the, another group called wood, hay, stubble. And you either are building on one or the other. And fire is going to uh, test this, and what is burned up is lost, and what is remains is is your is a reward. Now he's not using he's not speaking of gold and silver in a literal sense. He's using it here idiomatically. Those of you who've been in my office, you know there's two major walls. One wall has all my trophy, a lot of all, but a handful of my trophies and certificates from my corporate 30 years of corporate mergers and acquisitions and stuff. The other wall has all our ministry products and things on the wall. And if you look at the top of the wall, the top of the one says wood, hay, stubble. And the other one says gold, silver, precious stones. And you can figure out which one is which, right? Okay, all right. Okay. And it's to be tried by fire. And the point that Paul makes is even if you built on the wrong foundation, if you're saved, you're still saved, but you end up there getting there as if having fled a fire. Those that have built on a sound foundation will have rewards. That's what he's really dealing with. What he's really trying to point out is inheritances are forfeitable. Are forfeitable. And I often think, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's, there are those of us, apparently, according to Scripture, that will be reigning with Christ. But that doesn't mean all believers are. And uh, you want to understand the differences. The, the, you may be, the fact that you're saved gives you access to heaven but doesn't give you permission to rearrange the furniture. Okay. Is, is one, way of, one way of putting it. The people that are going to be the main best beneficiaries are the metakoi in the, in the Greek, or the koinonos, which are, these are the partakers of Christ's mission. You can be saved, because Jesus has arranged that for you. But um, uh, are you a partaker? Are you a partner? That's a whole other issue. Then we get to these three chapters on spiritual gifts. And uh, chapter 12 being the first of the three. 
And one of the emphases in chapter 12 is that the Holy Spirit gives the gifts as He will. Paul emphasizes the diversity of gifts but one spirit. The diversity of members but there's one body. The diversity of service but still one church. He's using the term church here in its mystical collective sense. One of the great tragedies, there's, there's two kinds of mistakes that you can make about spiritual gifts. One of the mistakes that you can make is to assume that they're over, that they were only there for the first century. There are people that teach, well, they were just there until some event, they argue. You can't justify that event from the Scripture, by the way. So the first, there are many very good Bible teachers, very sound seminaries, that nevertheless fail to recognize that the spiritual gifts are still enduring. That's the one mistake you can make, is to deny them. The other mistake you can make is to pick one and say it's better than all the others. And there are groups that take one particular gift and say, unless you've got that, you're really not with it, you know. And uh, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but the main point that Paul makes in chapter 12 is there are many different kinds and the Holy Spirit gives them as He chooses in a great variety. And uh, I, re <laughs> I remember Walter Martin um, had an experience when he was a very young minister. He was in New Guinea and there was a, a girl that was raised from the dead. And it, it made the magazines and became a, a talking point. It was part of his background. But he used to trade on that occasionally. <laughs> when he, uh, he would encounter someone that was you know, sort of a, on one of these points on spiritual gifts, he would look at them with great seriousness and say, do you have the gift of raising the dead? Oh, why? No. No. And Walter would look crestfallen. Oh, we'll pray for you so that you might enter in. And would give him this, he would start giving him this pattern that as if one gift was really the, the big one to have, you see. And he was, of course, being, he suddenly became, he was obviously had to recognize he was being facetious or sarcastic. Because his point was that um, you make a mistake picking any one gift. And, and, and incidentally, Paul tells you the one, if you're going to pick any of the highest, it would be the gift of prophecy. He'll do that in chapter 14. But anyway, uh, that gets us to chapter 14. He mentions that the greatest of these gifts is prophecy. Why? Because it most edifies the church. It convinces outsiders. Many of these other gifts are deniable. This is one that generally does convince outsiders if they're present in the meeting. And it, its use should be orderly. That's Paul's mission. But the main point I'm making here, between these two chapters, chapters 12 and 14, comes the climax. This is one of those places where the climax isn't at the end, it's right in the middle. Right in the middle, he plunges chapter 13. Because chapter 12 ends, I show you a more excellent way. And uh, he points out that all these gifts are without value if they're without love. So he emphasized the utter necessity of love, the moral excellency of love, and the abiding supremacy of love. And uh, so I think most of you are familiar with this passage. 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Those are harsh words. Those are strong words. But for those that would make a big thing of speaking in tongues or having a word of prophecy or whatever, they're eclipsed by love. And he goes on to describe what he's talking about love in the verses 4 through 7. He says, Love severeth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, and goes on. You know what's interesting about this passage is you can substitute the name of Christ. You say God is love. We use that a lot, right? Let's see if it works. Christ suffereth long in his kind. Christ envieth not. Christ vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. 
doth not but save himself unseemly, seeketh not his own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. He bears all things, believes all things, hopeth all things. It fits, doesn't it? Now, what we should do now to, get, to make the point is, let's put your name in there. Chuck suffereth long and is kind. Chuck envieth not. Chuck vaunteth not himself, is not puffed up. Boy, you don't have to go very far because you, you can't help but smile because it's facetious. Because the gap between Christ and ourselves is so dramatized by trying to fit our name in here. You follow me? Now there are some people you could put in here surprisingly comfortably. Those are the ones that are like Christ. I could put my wife in through here very comfortably. And uh, interesting exercise. Sobering exercise as you put your own name. As I put my name in there, it's embarrassing. But you get my point. Let's... Another thing about 1 Corinthians is it defines the gospel. You know, that's a term we use a lot, the gospel. You've heard that term many, many times. I ask you, what is the gospel? Well, that's the good news. That's evading the question. What is the gospel? It's astonishing to discover what the gospel really is. 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses, Paul defines it. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. That's the first three verses. We're to the fourth. What's disturbing about that, can you believe in vain? Ooh, that's a sobering thought for many. I believe, I believe. James is going to tell you devils also believe and tremble. Belief is not enough in itself. But let's go on. What is he talking about the gospel? He then defines it here. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Three parts. One, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It doesn't say He didn't disappear. He didn't just die. He died fulfilling hundreds of specifications. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Every detail about Jesus Christ was laid down in advance hundreds of years before. That's one of the three parts. Second part, and he was buried. It's strange that Paul would em emphasize that. He's the only one that does. And I, th I suspect it's because he builds a case on that regarding uh, baptism as an idiom of, of being buried and rose again. And then, of course, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And one of the exercises I typically give one of my students is, okay, where in the, scri the Scriptures there means the Old Testament, find the places in the Old Testament where it predicts that he would ra be, be raised on the third day. Well, Jonah, yeah, okay, Jesus pointed that, that. He gave you one of them. There's about three or four others. So that's your challenge is to dig those out. But the point is, what's astonishing to me about the gospel here is what Paul does not include. Paul makes no mention of his teachings. A lot of people in the world will grant that Christ was a wonderful teacher. I mean, a lot of wonderful teachers. Maybe none like him, but still, he's a wonderful teacher. Paul makes no mention of his example. He will in the book of Philippians, but that's not the gospel. He makes no mention of his miracles. None of these things are the gospel. And it's astonishing to discover how many churches have pulpits which will talk about everything about Jesus Christ except these three points. That he died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and rose again the third day. That's the gospel. And uh, it's the old-fashioned um, uh, covered by the blood bit. That's the gospel. And uh, Paul emphasized it. But then, of course, we get to the resurrection. And uh, Paul would, if Paul was standing here, I think he'd point to this as the most important chapter in the entire Bible. And, and, and the reason it is, is because if we don't, if, if Christ was not resurrected, we have nothing. That was the validation of everything that went on. From the book of Leviticus and all the offerings that were anticipatory of Christ, his, his, his death on the cross, all of that was validated 
uh, marked acceptable, so to speak, by the reality that he rose from the dead. And uh, because he did, we do. And uh, so that's Paul's whole point there. Now, this whole area of resurrection is an interesting controversy. A lot of people have trouble with the resurrection. Uh, uh, what happens when a cannibal eats another cannibal? And then some other cannibal eats that cannibal. And where's the body? How, how are you going to resurrect him? See, what every, everybody gets sort of hard. It's hard for us to visualize what we mean by resurrection. And I, I think for us in our, in our culture, we, should, we have an we have indebtedness to Michael Crichton for his piece of entertainment called Jurassic Park. Just a piece of entertainment, a piece of science fiction entertainment based on the premise that these creatures, prehistoric creature dinosaurs, were resurrected, if I can use that term, from a piece of information. As you may recall, the, the, his novel Jurassic Park that was made into a popular movie, the idea was that a mosquito that had taken a, some blood from a dinosaur that was captured in amber, which is then preserved, by because you can find amber and you can find mosquitoes in them, that's, uh, the idea is to take that blood, which will give you the DNA of the dinosaur, and from that DNA you can clone or re resurrect. That's, that's the concept. And obviously there's some bridges here that are pretty tough to cross, but the basic technology is comfortable to, uh, to, uh, to in a prognosis sense. So that gives, of course, the plot line to the Jurassic Park thing. But the point is it makes an interesting point. See, all... See, your... The atoms that make up your body, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and a bunch of others, are fungible building blocks. God doesn't have to have the carbon atoms that made up you today to resurrect you 10 years from now, or whenever. Or the hydrogen. Those are the building blocks. What he needs, it would seem, is your DNA. With your DNA, apparently that's, that's the definition of you. And so the, it helps us at least visualize that resurrection, it's not the old bodies that we're interested in anyway. And I'm not suggesting that our resurrection bodies are going to be made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen atoms. But if they were, they don't have to be the same ones. They can be whichever ones he wants to use. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? So the whole idea of resurrection is a little, are a little more easily visual, visualizable. Basic building blocks are fungible elements. And uh, the only requirement is the DNA. And maybe a little bit more. Now, what kind of a body is involved in the resurrection? Jesus is our, is our source, of course. His resurrection body is the model, if you will. First of all, understand that it was tangible. It wasn't like a ghost or a, a holographic image or something. He challenged them that night when he appeared among them. Handle me and see. The spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Remember? He's tangible. You can handle him and feel him. Now, it's, what's strange about this is they're in a room with a floor and a ceiling and four walls, I assume. Let's visualize it as a six-sided geometric figure, and they're inside. He was able to enter and leave that without passing through the walls or the, or the floor and the ceiling. And mathematically, he's in a hyperspace, obviously. But the point that he's hyperdimensional, that is spatially transcendent, is something that we, if, if uh, there's only two kinds of people that can deal with that, of course, as we mentioned in the very first, one of the early sessions of this review, and that's uh, mathematicians with special training or small children. But uh, there is a statement of physics in 1 John 3, 2 that I think is far more revealing than most people recognize without any background. In his first letter, John says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, what's he saying here? I believe what he's saying is we're going to enjoy the same dimensionality he does. If we're not going to, we're not going to see a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional being. We call that a photograph. A photograph is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional person or party or whatever, right? It won't be a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional being or a five-dimensional representation of a ten-dimensional being. What, it mean, what he's saying is we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. See, that implies to me 
that when he was among them in the upper room, they saw him, they handled him. But I suspect there was far more there than they could apprehend. That won't be our case when we're resurrected because we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So those peculiar uh, properties of his resurrection body are ones that we'll enjoy too. Strange stuff, but it's, it's, it's amazing how often in the scripture there are uh, physics statements in effect. But getting back to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul goes on, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, the word mystery in the Greek is not like we use the term. Mystery is something un not understood. The word mysterion in the Greek, from which that's translated, is actually something that's been a secret up till now I'm revealing it to you. The concept isn't so much hiding as much as now revealing in the, in the term. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Quite a statement. A couple of things about this. is in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It doesn't say in a blink of an eye. That's a long time. The twinkling of the eye is the time it takes light at the speed of light to transit your lens surface. And if you go through the arithmetic of that, it's pretty close to 10 to the minus 35 seconds, which is the shortest measure of time possible. There's a measurement of time. That's what quantum physics is about. Length, mass, energy, time, all are made up of indivisible units. And the smallest unit of time, I suspect, is what he's talking about here. Not a, anyway, at, at the last trump. Now, a lot of people try to make this trumpet, the last trump, uh, the seventh of the revelation. That's misunderstanding revelation. We'll deal with that when we get there. Um, but in any case, there will be a final trumpet as far as we're concerned, a maiden trumpet. When it sounds, and there's going to be more, we'll find out there's more about this that pa Paul will reveal to the Thessalonians when we get there. But this is, of course, this strange time when we shall, this instant. See, there... There will be a time, there will be a generation that won't die. Many of us in this room may pass away before that time comes, but some of us in this room may very well be alive at this instant when God gathers his church. And, uh, we're, and, and Paul will deal with that in depth in, the, in his Thessalonian letters. But there are seven transitions involved. We go from corruption to incorruptible, from dishonor, this flesh, to glory, from weakness to power, from the physical world to the spiritual world. Now this is where we usually get it upside down. We tend to think the physical world is the real world. The spiritual world is sort of this fuzzy, ghostly, uh, we, have, uh, we tend to look at it in secondary terms. It's the other way around. We know from particle physics that you and I live in a simulated world, a digital virtual reality, not a real reality. We're bounded in, something, in a finite universe on the one hand and part in, in the and a digital simulation on the, on the quantum side. So we, we're in that strange interval. No, the physical world is a subset of a larger reality. The spiritual world is the embracing of the larger reality. That's where we're transferred to. We're going from earthly to heavenly, from flesh and blood to the transcendent, and from mortal to immortal. Well, anyway, let's move on to 2 Corinthians. We've got a lot of, a lot of these to cover. Let's keep moving here. Um, so Titus, as I said, you know, brings a disturbing report because they're detractors that are attacking Paul's character. His opponents are hindering at cowardice and all this sort of thing. They insinuate doubts about his credentials, all this. So Paul is quite troubled by this. So Paul is forced to respond for the health of the gospel uh, there and throughout the region. And uh, so he uh, uh, has an impassioned uh, self-defense in Second Corinthians. A wounded spirit to erring and ungrateful children, as, as one person described it. A letter written with a quill dipped in tears, as one person described it from the apostle, uh, from his anguish of heart. It c contains more pathos than all his other letters. Um, the earlier letter is written from Ephesus, uh, uh, to, to Corinth from Ephesus, and uh, he was compelled to flee because there were some fanatical reactions to the, from the silver merchants there and so forth, the Dana thing and all that. And uh, so in any case, uh, he, he uh, eventually gets to Corinth, stays there three months, but at the interval between leaving Ephesus and Corinth, he wrote this letter, probably from Philippi on his way over there, deep, deeply affected uh, uh, the circumstances. So the second epistle of Corinthians, 
Christ is our comfort in, amid trial. He starts, of course, by uh, renouncing his critics, by uh, recounting his, his authority, his motive, and his message, and his background. And then he appeals to his converts about things spiritual and things material. He deals with both those issues. And he answers his critics and their pretensions. And he, he underscores his credentials. That's Second Corinthians has a great deal of his background where Paul unabashedly lays it on the line. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, there was three visits when it first founded, then the previous letter that's alluded to, and then the one that re resulted in 1 Corinthians, his response to Chloe's household. Then he has this painful visit where it was very tense, he, to which he writes a very severe letter that he's very apprehensive about. Titus is supposed to check it out. They finally do connect, and his report says they went well. And that caused him to write 2 Corinthians, this, this passion thing. But he's still dealing with some problems there. And then there's a final visit. So anyway, so much for the Corinthian letters. Move on to Galatians. Galatians um, is really a polemic against the perversion of the gospel. And that shouldn't surprise us that we see people today perverting the gospel. It's not a new problem. It's been there from the beginning. And Paul deals with it head on. See, Romans deals with what it means to be grounded in doctrine. Corinthians, how to be guided in practice. Galatians, how to be guarded against error. There's three slightly different tacks here. Romans is grounded, Corinthians is guiding in practice, and Galatians is, in a sense, guarded with error. Some people would call Galatians sort of a short Romans in some respects. And Paul had visited there prior to writing them. His second visit was less reassuring than the first. So he really nails them against errors. And uh, he speaks there of another gospel. If anyone preach another gospel than one I preach, let him be anathema, condemned to hell. He really hits that pretty hard. And uh, uh, it's, it, it, he emphasized the liberation through the gospel. He speaks of its authenticity. It's genuine to its origin. He argues it's genuine as to its nature. And uh, he talks about the superiority of the gospel of Christ, the new relation it affects, the privileges it releases, and the true liberty we have in Christ. This is perhaps its main underscore here. Uh, love service ends law bondage. The Galatians, just like the book of Romans, deal with our freedom from the law. We, we have a service of love rather than a bondage to the law. And uh, so there's a big tension between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh being bondage to the law and the spirit being freed from the law. And he em emphasized that very hard. And uh, it's a, there's a catalog of compromises. In it. Faith versus works is one of them. Grace versus the law, it reflects that. Spirit versus the flesh. These are all echoes of the same kind of tension. Truth versus error. The church versus the state. We see that in this country. Christianity versus paganism. We live in a culture where our government schools inculcate paganism on our children. Christ versus the pseudo-Christ. So again, there's this, this whole profile. Of, uh, these are all echoes of somewhat the same tension, if you will. Flesh versus spirit. You know, Abraham uh, was 430 years before the law. And the point that Paul makes in Galatians is the promises of God preceded the law. And the law cannot, the, the promises cannot be disannulled by the law because Abraham had the promises long before Moses, long before the law was given, for, and so on. And Paul even makes this distinction between Ishmael. He portrays Ishmael as the son of the flesh, Isaac, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And he, he speaks of these two sons, idiomatically, if you will, as the flesh and the Spirit. Ishmael of the flesh, that is unbelief. And he says, the son of the bond woman will not be heir. And his point is, not the person, his point is what he represents. Isaac is of the promise. He's a, he was a response to faith. It was Abraham's uh, uh, trusting God to resurrect Isaac that saved him. See, the ultimate triumph of faith was the offering of Isaac. And Paul hammers that home in, in Galatians 4. So what, yeah, let's, we've talked about the gifts of the Spirit in Corinthians. We are not called to be gift inspectors. We've been called to be fruit inspectors. So what are the fruits of the Spirit? Or I can call this little segment, How's Your Love Life? <laughs> I'm not using it in the Hollywood sense. See, fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. These are the gifts of the Spirit. There's nine of them, right? It's interesting. The first three are fruits in the heart. Love, joy, peace. The next three are fruits that affect your neighbor. 
long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And the next three are those that relate, that manifest your relationship to God. Faith, meekness, self-control. It's interesting that the, the second and third of each triad here is, is uh, echoing the first. Joy is love exalting, and peace is love responding. Uh, gentleness is long-suffering, that's passive, and goodness is long-suffering, that's active. See, these things are not just a, a list of words that sound good. There, there's some deep structure behind this. And uh, meekness is faith toward God, and self-control, faith in your life. So these are the nine gifts of the Spirit. And these are the ways that you can tell where you're at in terms of your spiritual growth. Not by the gifts you manifest, speaking in tongues or whatever. No. Uh, what are the fruits of the Spirit? And that's what's the critical thing. Now, he also talks about fruit bearing. Those are the nine fruits of the Spirit. There's also, Paul emphasized burden bearing. Bear one another's burdens. And then he also talks about seed bearing. Whatsoever a man sows, there, that's what he shall reap. And finally, he talks about brand bearing or mark bearing, if you will. I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus, he goes on. Let's talk about brand bearing or mark bearing, if you will. There are a handful of places that you had brands. Slaves had a brand. That was a mark of ownership. They were branded to say who owned them. Soldiers had a mark on them, mark of allegiance. What, were they, what was their allegiance to? Criminals had a mark on them, a mark of conviction. You know, the 26401 and Les Miserables, whatever, okay. And uh, the people that were abhorred had a mark of reproach on them. Devotees would have a mark of consecration. Paul's body had all five. Because he was a slave to Christ. He was a soldier for the gospel. He was a criminal in the sense he was convicted indeed. And uh, he was abhorred by some. He had the, the marks to prove it, and yet he had also a mark of consecration. So Paul, Paul actually had all five. But the summary of the whole book of Galatians, it can be in one verse. Paul asked him, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect in the flesh? See, the Galatians were saved, but they were all hung up with legalism, keeping the law. He says, are you guys so foolish? What God has begun in the Spirit... Are you not going to be made com perfect or completed in the flesh? Hardly. And that's, that, that's the undergirding, undergirding uh, logic throughout the whole epistle. Okay, well, uh, we've, let's take a look at one of the capstones of the whole series, Ephesians. Um, its doctrinal statement is on ecclesiology. Most people have no idea what the church is. And Ephesians is the secret to this, in a sense. Our wealth in Christ... And Paul goes through our praise for spiritual possession, the prayer for spiritual perceptions, our new condition in Christ, our new relation in Christ, revealing the divine mystery and the divine fullness, and our walk in Christ. So we have our wealth in Christ, the first three chapters, and the, our walk in Christ in the last three. So we've got the first three are conceptual, the last three are practical, the church corporately, believers individually, and all the way through, climaxing in the armor of God that we'll talk about when we get there. But one of the things that, one of the, when did God first start dealing with you? And that's expressed in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Paul says, according as he hath chosen us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. That's astonishing to realize God had you on his mind before the world was created. Having predestinated us to the adoption of children by the Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. See, the word, the, the word chosen, by the way, in, in verse 4 there, is in the aorist tense in the Greek. That means once and for all. It's also in the middle voice. We have active voice and passive voice. The Greek has a middle voice. It adds a sense of choosing for one's own self. In other words, you are a participant in his choosing. And you're chosen out of the world once and for all for God's own peculiar uh, uh, pleasure. You were, chosen, you were chosen to be holy because we were her, not because we were holy, but in order for us to be holy. That's why we were chosen. Now the word adoption here is misleading as we tend to use it in our culture. They had a different concept. You could be born of a father, but you didn't accede to your rights as a son until there was a formal public ceremony called adoption. And uh, the, the adoption meant the public attestation 
of adult uh, sonship. And that's when you were conferred, had conferred upon you your privileges as a son. Up till the adoption, you were a son technically, but you were treated as a slave in the house. When you were adopted as a son, you then acceded to the rights of maturity, if you will. And uh, we are already sons of God, according to John 1 and uh, other passages. But he's predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Very, par very par powerful point. A sort of parallel, if you remember the uh, story of, Quo, uh, of um, Ben Hur, when Quintus Arius, the, the, uh, a prominent Roman, adopts uh, uh, Judah Ben Hur as his son. He then has all the privileges as if he was his actual son. But uh, anyway, and verse 7 he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The word redemption simply means to be released from, by ransom. We've been ransomed. We've been paid for. In whom we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And uh, so, a ransom paid in respect of the eternal princes, principles of righteousness which govern the universe. The holy laws of God which humans have outraged. You say, gee, my sins don't seem that big. That's because you don't understand how pure God is. The problem isn't your sin alone. The problem is the gap between you and a holy God. That's what we can't grasp. And that's the, that's the holiness that has been outraged by our behavior. And then we, he has in this epistle the concept of sealing. He says, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. This was something that Paul had a hard time really grasping. He was trained as a Pharisee. He was trained under Gamaliel. The concept that the Holy Spirit was, had sealed us was mind-blowing to him. He could remember King Saul. Spirit went and came. All through the Old Testament, the Spirit would be there and then he wouldn't be. In other words, it was, uh, he, he had his own volition. Here we're entering a period in which the Holy Spirit is God's commitment. A, there's a concept of irrevocability involved here. Which the, in which that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. The earnest is like a down payment that seals the bargain. And uh, a prepayment, if you will, to seal the bargain and so forth. But then we have this incredible passage. People who have not memorized other scriptures generally have included this in their list. How are we saved? For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. In other words, the faith itself is a gift. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. The faith itself to, by which you uh, gain the grace is a gift of God. Why? Not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. God did, what God did the whole job, and he wants full credit for it. To try to add to your salvation is blasphemy. You're trying to add to something that God has completed. He goes on, for we are his workmanship, his poema. Same word from which we get poem. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now one of the questions you sooner or later will ask yourself is why did God bother? God knew before he created the universe that Adam, given a chance, would blow it. And he puts Adam with his own free will, knowing he's going to get himself in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God will avail to get him out of it. Didn't God see this coming? Of course he did. All the sin, all the pain, all the suffering in the world caused by sin. Didn't God see this coming? Why bother? The answer is not in these two few, few verses. It's the verse that comes just ahead of this that people overlook. Not verse, verse 8, but verse 7. His ultimate purpose is disclosed here. He says that in ages, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. See, how can God demonstrate infinite power? Well, one way you get a glimpse of that is look through a telescope and try to understand the universe. The more you study it, the more astonishing it is. Infinite power. The concept of infinite knowledge 
we can probably begin to imagine, not thoroughly embrace. But how do you demonstrate infinite love? And I suggest to you that by putting man in a situation in which to extricate him from that, it would take nothing else but the death of God himself. This whole panorama that started at Eden gets its peak at the cross at Golgotha. It's a demonstration of infinite love as we, we will spend an eternity trying to understand what it cost him. God's creation is phenomenal, but let's take a look at the... In the Bible, there's what, a couple of chapters? A couple of chapters in Genesis? A couple of chapters in Isaiah, Job, a few? That's about it for creation. How many... How much of the Bible is dedicated to redemption? Well, the whole book of Genesis. The whole thing of Exodus. I mean, as you study each book, you realize each book is primarily focused on God's plan of redemption, all the way to Revelation, which is the climax. Another way to measure importance isn't just how much the Bible spends on it. The other way is, let's talk about what it cost him. What did the creation cost him? Six days. He breathed it out of his nostrils. The creation, as manifest as it is, he did in six days. What did the redemption of you and me cost him? The death of his son. The death of his I heard a recent presentation by Joe Foch that really touched me, where he described the last week of Christ from the point of view of the Father. Joe being a father, having had his son go through an emergency, we had to get to emergency and have deal with doctors that weren't really on their toes and stuff. The pain of the father seeing his son abused was vivid in his mind. And it occurred to him, can you imagine God the Father enduring the insults and the abuse of his son? Never, never dawned on me the pain, the agony. From the father's point of view, we generally visual, you know, try to visualize it from Christ's point of view. From the Father's point of view, it's a whole other dimension. Anyway, all this to demonstrate love. Now, there's another mystery that's in the book of Ephesians that we want to touch on. In, back, in the Matthew, back in Matthew 11, Jesus made a strange remark about John the Baptist. He says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now, wait a minute, that's quite a statement. Among all them that are born of women, there's none greater than John. Excepting, of course, Christ. Let's set that aside. There, verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That's quite a statement. But before he finishes his sentence, look what he says. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What? Does that mean John the Baptist wasn't saved? No. No. It's explained a few verses later. Jesus says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. What he's saying is John is the end of the Old Testament. He says the same thing as recorded in Luke 16, 16. See, we need to recognize that John the Baptist is the closure of the Old Testament. Not Malachi. That happens to be the last book in our Bible, but in our, Old Testament, in our Bible in the Old Testament. No, the Old Testament goes until John the Baptist. Was John the Baptist saved? Yes, but he was saved as an Old Testament saint. Jesus is introducing something fresh, and it's Paul's privilege to reveal it more fully. And he makes a big point of that. A mystery revealed. This is in Ephesians 3. The first dozen verses are very important. You see, it was no secret that Christ was to come and bear the sins of many. That's all through the Old Testament. It was no secret that he would be a prince and a savior to both Jews and Gentiles. Isaiah talks a lot about that. There is no secret that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. Joel and others speak of that. There was no secret that the remission of sins was to be preached. And the throne of David and all that. Stuff. All these things are in the Old Testament. But the church is not. The church is not. Well, what is the church then? See, that's the key. Well, that, that. See, this is what Paul's privilege was. In Ephesians 3, he says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Paul speaking which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. What? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. 
and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The implications of that are staggering. It doesn't mean just that Gentiles can be saved, but they are going to enjoy a relationship, a fellowship, being joint heirs with Christ. That's a whole other thing. And that's what's so astonishing about the, 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 what's available to you and I. Um, and Paul, many of us don't understand his epistles because we don't, we don't understand the answer because we don't understand the problem. You need to understand, uh, you won't really understand this unless you really understand the, the, the Old Testament to realize what a unique benefit this is. Anyway, the hope of his calling, the resurrection, immortality, our joint reign with Christ, the eternal inheritance, seven, these are all emphases. Perfect transformation of the image of Christ, all these things are his hope. But there's another verse just to show you, the Fe- Ephesians is just an incredible epistle. In verse 18 of chapter 3, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being grounded and and, rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Incredible passage except, uh, what did he say? The breadth and length and depth and height. How many dimensions are there? Four. Four. You know, the Bible is the only book on the planet Earth that transcends a three-dimensional universe in many, many ways, but here's just one, one example where we see a four-dimensional. And one of those words in the Greek represent time, by the way, of that fourth dimension. But then let's get to the final wrap-up in the Ephesians series. It says, our cosmic warfare, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, he says, but what against... And we have here a group of Greek words that are actually ranks of angels. These are the rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And he's not just talking about you know, ranks as we might think in Washington. He's talking about the, the dark world. That's what we're up against. So here's our imperative. He says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, be completely armed. Put on the whole armor, not just your favorite pieces. To do that, you need to know what the whole armor is. When do you do this? Not during the battle. You do this, you put the armor on before the battle begins, but I got bad news for you. We're already in it and we're on enemy turf. Now, many people think as he's going to get into the seven elements of the armor. Most people assume he's, he mentions this because he's chained to a... a, a a uh, Roman soldier. He's chained to the Roman soldier so the Roman soldier couldn't get away. Can you imagine standing a full shift of duty chained to Paul? But, uh, and many people assume he's taking these idioms of the armor for, by looking at the soldier. That's, that's naive because he's drawing these idioms from the Old Testament. Isaiah 59, 17, he speaks of righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head and the garments and so on. So these idioms are not unique to Paul's uh, experience there. But let's just look at it quickly. To be girded with truth. What is truth? Pilate cynically asked. Well, that's a big issue. And we obviously can't develop it here, but I challenge you to find out what that really means. What do you mean girded with truth? And ha- put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protected your vitals. A piercing of it usually was fatal. You need to have a breastplate of righteousness. And if you're relying on your own righteousness, you're in deep trouble. It's got to be Christ's righteousness. Your feet shod with preparation. Those of you who've been hand-to-hand or boxing or wrestling or whatever, you know the importance of proper footwork. Feet shot with preparation. And um, um, we, 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 need to, we need to realize there's training and preparation required. How many of you, let me put it this way, in one book of the Bible, seven different people on 12 different occasions gave a Bible study that always produced a lot of fruit for the kingdom, and we never do this today. What Bible study was given by seven different people in 12 different occasions that always was very fruitful and yet we never do it today? Astonishing. What is that Bible study? Presenting Jesus Christ entirely from the Old Testament. All through the book of Acts, when they presented Christ from the Scriptures, the Scriptures they're talking about was the Old Testament. They presented Christ from the Old Testament. How many of you could present to a Jewish friend the Messiah of Israel using just the Tanakh, the Old Testament? not hard to do. It takes a little training, a little outline to follow, a little bit of training. 
but it takes preparation. And the shield of faith. You know, the, uh, the shield was something that they repaired between battles. You don't go into battle with a hole in your shield. Are there holes in your, in your faith? Are there things that bother you that you've never really had answers? Chase them down. Fix them now. Otherwise, they'll come back to haunt you. The helmet of salvation. Boy, that's a whole other subject. Just owning one is not enough. You better be wearing it. You can tell the people who don't wear their helmets by the bandages. But the last one, well, not the last, the next to the last one, is the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. We all, most people recognize that idiom. The sword of the Spirit. In the, uh, in, in, in the history of military technology, generally a long sword was an advantage because you had more reach. But the Romans did something very, very strange. They developed a double-edged, short, 24-inch machaira. And with that short sword, they conquered the world. Um, but there's some things you need to understand about the machaira. The reason they did is because they had special training on how to use it, and they practiced, 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 practiced. The same thing's true with your sword that's in your lap right now. You need to be trained to use it, and you need practice. Sword of the Spirit. Um, but the, the seventh is your heavy artillery. That's your action at a distance kind of weapon. Prayer. Right now, there are troubled missionary opportunities around the world. And you can participate in those opportunities without an airline ticket in your bedroom by getting on your knees and holding those missionaries up in prayer. People come up to me and say, Chuck, what can we do for your ministry? Number one, pray for us. It is a warfare. God will take care of the rest. And then our final imperative, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. This is the imperative mood. That means it's a command. It's not a suggestion. Be strong. Where? In the Lord. It's in the present tense. That means be continually strong. Not just not, it's not a once, a once occasion kind of thing. And it's in the passive voice. You receive the action. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And then just a picture of Ephesus to remind us that this was a real place. These are elegant letters with very, very high concepts, but there, it, was, it was real people in real places having real problems, just like you and I have. That's what it's all about. Well, let's zip through a few more here and we'll wrap it up. Philippians rejoices through suffering. Christ in our life, Christ in our mind, Christ in our goal, Christ in our strength. Joy through suffering. Paul said, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. See, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Boy, how many athletes use Philippians 4.13 on their signatures? That's interesting. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Joy through suffering. That's the thing. There is a passage in here called the kenosis, a very unusual passage in, Ephesians, excuse me, in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. This is sometimes called by some the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ, who being in the form of God deemed it not to be selfishly clung to, but emptied himself. Wow. And took the form of a bondman Becoming in the likeness of men, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Ephesians 2, 5 and following, it's called the kenosis or the mind of Christ. The most astonishing example of humility possible in the universe where God himself deigns. There's seven elements here. You can study it on your own. We've got to keep moving here. Colossians is another one of these incredible epistles. It's a response to the Gnostics. Gnostics comes from the Greek word meaning to know. This means uh, 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 to, you know, secret knowledge or esoteric knowledge. Huxley uh, coined the term agnostic, meaning without knowledge. You see people proudly say, well, I'm an agnostic. That's the Greek root. If you take the Latin root, the word is ignoramus. <laughs> it, it doesn't go over so well at cocktail parties. Well, I'm an ignoramus. It doesn't quite work, but you get the idea. Anyway. The Gnostics claimed to have special knowledge. It was a, mi a mixture of mysticism, Eastern speculation, and Jewish legalism. It's fascinating. This has many forms, and we see it emerging today. Even in Hollywood, there's a big fascination with the Kabbalah, which is a uh, Hebrew mysticism. The pattern is pretty straightforward. At first, if you reject God, you become materialistic. And when you discover that materialism, which tends to be self-oriented, 
um, is empty or vacuous, you then, and you've already rejected God, the next natural place is to look to mysticism. Is there anybody out there? And so uh, mysticism comes up in many forms throughout, through, throughout history, and Colossians is one of the rebuttals to that. Alexandria was a major headquarters for the Gnostics. That's why the Alexandrian manuscripts uh, by Westcott and Horton and others have come under some suspicion in more recent places. Eastern speculations plus mysticism, uh, man-made traditions and philosophy in a sense. Matter was considered evil. They even had a form of astrology, thinking that uh, stars were really angelic beings and they were somehow associated with heavenly bodies and so on. Um, and, uh, they also mixed into this some Jewish legalism. Good and evil were derived from rules. That's always, the, oh, watch out for that. Uh, circumcision, or Old Testament dietary laws were embraced by them, strangely enough. And uh, so anyway, um, the Colossians is in effect corrections uh, to these abuses. And uh, so there's a doctrinal, it's the fullness of Christ. Christ is, preempt, is preemptive over all things. And there's a lot of practical issues that derive from that, both individually uh, and collectively. And then he has a personal agenda. Colossians is a great book on Christology, the visi- of Christ himself, the visible form of the invisible God, the prior head of all creation. In him was the universe created. He is before the universe. In him the universe coheres. He not only created, he holds it together. The head of the body of the church. Some very, very high thoughts here in, the, in, in Colossians. He's the firstborn from among the dead. And the uh, key verse in for Colossians 1, for by him, Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. For he is before all things, and by him are all things held together. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, and in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. We have the epistles to the Thessalonians, which are the culmination. It's actually the earliest of the epistles, but probably also in some respects the climax. We're going to deal with that in the, next se- in the session after next, where we'll, he'll remind them of things Paul taught them in the first few weeks of their Christian walk. We'll talk about the harbatsu, the rapture, and all of that. And uh, in, the, in the next session, we're going to talk about the a review of eschatology, the study of the last things. We'll talk about amillennial, premillennial, what is the rapture, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, does the church go through the trib, all these things will be done, not in the next session, session 21, the session after next. So there we are. We have uh, the four pastoral epistles, which are pretty straightforward. The, uh, how many of you are in the full-time ministry? Can I see a show of hands? Good for you. How many of you are saved? Okay, how many of you are in the full-time ministry whether you know it or not? Okay, you're caught up with me. All right, okay. So these pastoral epistles appear to uh, 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 apply to all of us. And uh, they talk about the diversity of gifts, the depth of commitment, the challenges that are predictable. It, impis- it anticipates the problems you are having today. These epistles are, are God's special message. And uh, so uh, Timothy was Paul's protege, and he gave him a lot of good counsel in terms of the assembly and conduct and so forth. And uh, the offices of deacons and elders are all spelled out there. And uh, the assembly in general and in particular groups and how to deal with them. The second epistle is probably one of the most interesting ones because it's probably the last epistle he wrote. He was in prison. He was in prison facing death and he's encouraging Timothy. I love that. I th- something's backwards there. He talked about true pastors under testings, the personal reaction, the true pastoral reaction. And he talks about end time troubles that are coming. And... Uh, and he also includes warnings. Some have turned aside. Some have made a shipwreck. Some fall away. In other words, the whole theme is finishing well is the challenge. You've got a good start. How are you going to finish is what's... Some have missed the mark. Some have been led astray. See, our challenge, you and I, if we're saved, if we're not saved, you've got other issues. But once you're saved, then your next thing is, can you finish well? And that's what these letters are all about. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only but unto all them also that love his appearing. And he said, for this cause I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and, that I, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He's the guardian of your real treasures. Titus is another letter. He, Titus was Paul's troubleshooter, one of his most trusted workers. He accompanied Paul and Barnabas on the difficult trip to the Jerusalem council. He sent on diplomatic missions to Corinth. And uh, uh, in Macedonia and elsewhere, he's, he, Paul left him in, often leaves him in authority. Paul, he, he's his cleanup guy. 
and he and he has a great uh, epistle about uh, keeping things in order and and um, and how to deal with members of the people in general and so forth. There's every art gallery has room for one little small masterpiece, and this list of epistles has one little gem at the end. Little letter to Philemon has a little salutation, a praise of Philemon himself. Paul's writing him to him. And there's a guy by the name of Onesimus who's been a runaway slave from Philemon. He's met Paul. He's become saved. Paul is sending him back to Philemon. He's, uh, and and uh, he's telling Philemon to treat him. He says, you owe me, buddy. And whatever you owe you, put it on my credit card. That's really what he's saying. So Paul's pledge and assurance is there. And you see, what's interesting, it's, it's, it's an example of intercession. Paul is interceding for Onesimus uh, to, to Philemon on the behalf of Onesimus. What's, it's a beautiful gem because you and I are also God's property and are fugitives. And uh, our guilt is great. Our penalties are heavy, just like Onesimus. And uh, the law condemns us and conscience betrayed us. And yet uh, Jesus says, as Paul did here, put it all on my account. And so uh, there's a benediction and a close on things. So that's it.